this lady. She crazy. Let's get it for Mara, our MC. Come on. It's an honor to be here, and uh, I feel like I want to take a picture of everybody, but at some point, we, like, uh, you know, in those panos, there's like blinding light. So at some point, we'll make, we'll make this happen by the end of this weekend. This is just amazing to see you. It's amazing to see you guys in the hallways, working out this morning at the yoga across the way. I, I missed that, the Uruguay yoga. Uh, it's, it's the new big thing, there's hot yoga, and then there's Uruguay yoga. So it's pretty awesome, but just, you guys being here and making the commitment to be here. And I have a feeling that you came here this weekend because you want to be astonished. I think you came here because you want to see God do something amazing. Is that right? I think about astonished. It's a word that's used in the Bible. Sometimes people use it. I remember maybe in third grade, I read my, a book, maybe Curious George, and he was astonished. It's not a word I hear a lot. But it's something I think that we... We all want to be astonished. I have a definition. Greatly surprised or impressed. Amazed. I love to be astonished. That's why I watched the Super Bowl all the way through to the end. <laughs> How many of you guys stopped at like halftime? You're like, eh, this is so over. No team has ever come back from a 10-point deficit. Yeah, but they didn't have Tom Brady as a quarterback. So um, I think about the Seahawks game when they played the Green Bay Packers. And I uh, love Michael Bennett here riding the bike at the end. And they came all the way back, and they, they beat him with the, you know, the onside kick. And you know they didn't throw a quick slant in the end zone. They actually scored like a different way. <laughs> but we love to be astonished. We love to be blown away. And that's why we watch the game all the way to the end. I was lucky enough on a, I think it was a Thursday night this last year. I just, I don't, I don't often watch uh, ESPN because I get kicked off by my kids. They're watching other stuff on TV and they don't want to see ESPN, but I turned it on and it was Kobe's last game. How many of you guys watched Kobe Bryant's last game? Or at least saw highlights of it, okay? So Kobe Bryant's very last game, you got Shaq, you got all these like, you know, stars, rap stars, Hollywood stars, Jack Nichols, son. All these people like in the rows uh, in LA, I wish it Jack Nicholas, but he wasn't there. Uh, but uh, watching this game, wondering what's Kobe gonna do in the last game? Because his, I mean, his stats went way down his last couple years. I mean, his contract was huge and his stats were small. But uh, he went off. I mean, they were playing the Utah Jazz and they were down by like 18 points. And then Kobe went and did what Kobe does. And he just went nuts. He just kept hitting shots, hitting shots, people in his face, double team, didn't matter. He scored 60 points and hit free throws to ice the game to win. It came back from like this 20 point deficit. I was astonished by myself in my living room. And all I could do is go to Twitter and see who else in the world's astonished with me? Any hashtags? <laughs> like we search hashtags to be astonished with people. We try to find people who are astonished. We watch YouTube videos and look at memes and we Snapchat. We want to be astonished. That's why Snapchat's such a big deal, right? How many Snapchatters here? You want to be astonished. You don't look at it and think like, oh, cool, I want to see somebody like taking a picture of their backyard. No, you want to see something amazing like someone doing a backflip, right? We want to be astonished. And I think, as Kent was sharing last night, that we are made in the image of God. And that God was very, very pleased. It was very good when he saw his creation. That God was even astonished, like, wow, look at this. Look at these people made in my image. This is amazing. We were made in the image of God, and we want to be astonished as well. We want to be blown away. We want to see incredible things. And I think about, that's why I'm a part of Young Life. I want to be astonished. I want front row seats like the emerging leaders here. I want to be right up close, and I want to see what's going to happen, and I want to see God do something incredible right before my eyes. Why is that? I think part of it's because I'm really skeptical, and I've grown up just doubting everything, and I don't believe in myself, and I get depressed, and I don't think that big things can happen, and somehow I think there's something faulty within me that, that when I'm a part of something, it's not going to go well, and so when something does go well, and a prayer is answered, and God works, it's kind of like this slap in the face going, stop it, let me show you what I can do. We want to be astonished. We were made to be astonished. And I think about Young Life, and, and as I led, my first full year leading Young Life, uh, I shared a story last year at our Regional Leadership Day here in beautiful Pasco, the wonderful Tri-Cities. I shared a story about these, these kids that, uh, that God just moved in their life, and they, were, they didn't want anything to do with God, 
And God like showed up at a party and gave this girl this rock and said, you're going to need it. And spoke to this kid in a pet store. Uh, it was just crazy stuff. If you were here last year, you know what I'm talking about. If not, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But I didn't tell the end of the story. Um, that night at Young Life, we invited any kid that wanted to open the door. You hear God standing at the door knocking. If anyone open the door and come, hear his voice and come and open the door. And then we gave an invitation at the end of uh, Young Life Club. So if anybody wants to open the door to God, grab a rock and come down to the Everett Waterfront. And uh, 37 kids came down and committed their lives to Christ. 37 kids committed their lives to Jesus. <laughs> I was astonished. I'm thinking, like, I thought I, when I'm a part of something that God's doing, I'm going to screw it up because I'm too faulty. And somehow I saw that God's like, it's not even about you, Jeff. It's not even about you. I was at Malibu this last summer. I have this picture here. This is a guy named Terrell and uh, a leader named Justin Yoke. His sister has been a leader of Lakeside up in north, northwest Spokane. Um, Justin's hanging out with my son Dietrich and my daughter Jana right now um, here in Tri-Cities. But uh, his mom is a cross-country teacher, uh, coach at Southridge High School. Any leaders at Southridge High School? I knew you were here. Uh, Mariner High School in Everett. This is where I left to move to the Inland Northwest. <coughs> And uh, Terrell is one of our guys. Uh, he, he is one of those kids that hardly ever came to Young Life Club. When you go do contact work, he's the kid that kind of acts like you're not there. You're like, come on, I'm, I'm here. Like, I took time off to be at school. They'll walk past me, like most kids do. Uh, he came to Malibu, and it was this really big deal. And on the very last night, he committed his life to Jesus. Uh, right, night six. And we were so blown away. And then we had say-so. We are getting ready for say-so. And I get called into the office at Malibu. And I get called in, his brother called him, uh, Terrell's mom died. Now Terrell, didn't, he doesn't have a dad. So his mom was his everything. So he just committed his life to Jesus, and I just get a call that his mom died. And now I gotta, we got to get Justin and Nick together to go sit him down and tell him. This is terrible timing. Like, this is awful. And so, say so happens, the mic goes around, everyone's excited, and we have to pull Terrell aside. And it was, it was one of the worst moments of my life. Bring him into the office at Malibu. He's there getting the phone call, talking to his brother. He starts smashing chairs in the office, broke a couple chairs, screaming, cussing, yelling, going up and down Main Street. No one knows what's going on. There's this angry kid right after say so. What's happening? He gets up and he's crying by himself. And people start coming around and pushing everybody away. And uh, Cam, who's the leader at uh, North Central in Spokane, uh, Cam was a boat driver, some of staff. Cam just jumped right in and put his hands. Uh, on him and say, God's got your mom taken care of. God's got your mom. And all of a sudden, it just hit him. Wait, I just committed my life to Jesus. That means I, I'm, my soul is secure for eternity with Jesus. And my mom knew Jesus. And God's got my mom, and God's got me. Holy crap, everything's going to be okay. And you know that peace that surpasses all understanding that we talk about and you read the verse about that most people don't experience because we have so much freaking anxiety? He had that just came over him, and all of a sudden, all his friends who were crying and huddled around him, he just stops, and he turns this thing around, where everyone's feeling sorry for him, and he starts calling everybody out and speaking truth to all of them. He starts talking to them, he starts giving a prophetic word, which is like a word directly from the Lord to other people, and starts speaking prophetic words so that this guy's been a Christian for 90 minutes. <laughs> and he's speaking prophetic words to everybody, and he called me out. He's like, Jeff, when's the last time you talked to your mother? I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> Did you tell her that you love her? I'm like, oh, I don't remember. He's like, you're avoiding her, aren't you? I'm like, ah, oh, but she's so dramatic. Like, everything's so happening. <laughs> He's like, you need, you, when you get home from Malibu, you call your mom. And you tell her that you love her. And you listen to her. And you ask her what's going on in her life. And you celebrate her. And when you're done, I want a text message that you did. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, I was astonished. By the end of the night, 1.30 in the morning, there's a huge crowd of kids in Big Squawka crying, and he's still going. He's not done. He's talking to everybody. He's talking to Jeffrey Chambers and Shalane and calling him out. He's talking to uh, Cam. He's talking to all of us. <laughs> he became a man of truth in a matter of moments by one word of God through a person who decided to step in and bring Jesus into a situation. I was astonished. When's the last time that you've been astonished? When's the last time you've seen God do something? When's the last time you stepped into a situation that you didn't know what to do and thought, you know, I'm going to bring Jesus in this because I don't know what else to do. God made us to experience this. And I think you came here 
this weekend because you want to be astonished this year. And that's what we're about. That's what Young Life is about. That's what our region is about. That's what your team is about and your area is about. And God's inviting you to be a part of what he is doing. You look at Jesus throughout uh, the Gospels and you see how many times people were astonished. I look at this. I, I could go on and on, but the miraculous catch of fish. You know, well, I've been fishing all night. It's not going to Because you say so. Okay. Shh. Tosses the, tosses the nets in. Feeding 5,000. Astonished. Healing lepers. Talking to a Samaritan woman. People were astonished. Like this didn't, this kind of engagement didn't happen. <laughs> Jesus math. His math is amazing. When he talked to the Samaritan woman, it astonished people. He would go out of his way to talk to this woman, and she was astonished. When he turned water into wine at a, at a wedding feast, it blew people away. They were astonished. When he spoke, he spoke with an authority, and people were astonished. Because he didn't speak like other teachers. It's like he knew like the backstory of all the scripture that people were talking about and regurgitating. When he died, people were sad. But when he rose again, they were astonished. And when he showed up and he reinstated Peter, who had denied him three times, people were astonished. Why? Why does he want us to be astonished? Why does he want to astonish us? Why? Why does, why does he just like make things just so clear? Why does there got to be like these cliffhangers in these situations where there's all these people that can't eat and there's no fish and there's people that you shouldn't talk to and that he died? And what, why does he keep doing this? Because he wants us to see he is able. He wants us to see that he can do a measure more than we can ask or imagine. He wants us to look to him and to trust him, to give our life to him, that when he says, come, follow me, then we're like, oh, heck yes. Rather than, oh, no, 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 my life's pretty good right now, right? I like, got things going for me. I got lots of friends. And... He wants us to be astonished because then we let go of what we have and we take all that he has to give us. And so if you haven't been astonished lately, I want to say buckle up. Because that's what we want to do. That's what we want to be a part of, what he is doing, what Jesus is doing. I want to share some vision. I want to share an invitation that I, as I've talked with staff and volunteers and committee people over the last year and four months that I've had the joy of being here, I've picked up some themes, and I just want to run with it. And I want to invite you to run with us, to be astonished at what God can do. And it's a vision that none of us can do on our own. It's nothing that you feel like, if you feel weight or pressure as we talk, I want to invite you to stop there and pray and say, God, what are you asking me to do? Because this isn't about young life. We could have totally different logos going on here and want to say the same thing. I want to be astonished by God. You know the awesome thing is? That all these things that God can do, he always wanted to invite us to be a part of it. Jesus was always inviting someone into the scene to step out, to say yes, to follow him. He wants you to be astonished. He wants to invite you to be a part of his kingdom, as Kent mentioned last night. He wants you to be a part of it. He could just do it all himself. That's not his plan. That's not the way he works. We have a relational God that says, come, come with me, cast your nets, take these bread and loaves. I'll do the math. Don't worry about it. As we talk about where we're going, I think it's first important to say who we are. Because in this room and in the vision of Young Life, there's a certain DNA. You meet people and you're like, oh, that's such a Young Life person. How do you know? You, you, you've run into these people before. You, you know, the security guards get called at a hotel. Um, I don't know if it's the stickers in the car or just how crazy some people are, but there's some certain elements that you can see, just the way that people worship and lean into Jesus and kind of a reckless abandon. I want to talk about five things that I think really mark what our region has gotten young life, that I think is, is consistent with young life as a whole. First of all, we're, very, we're so Christ-centered. Everything's about Jesus. That's how we can get together with Catholics all the way across to, like, we don't need an order of service. We're just going to follow the Holy Spirit, you know, the two ends of the spectrum, like totally planned and organized, totally, like, not organized at all because the Spirit's got it. And everyone in between, the Presbyterians and Methodists and people that are half asleep, people are just like, wow, I'm crazy and, like, always having a word, uh, no preparation because God's going to supply. We can take them all in. We got a room full of those people. I'm saying that. You're like, hey, you're talking about me. Is he picking on me right now? Do I don't prepare, prepare my club talks? Like, yeah, I'm talking to you. There's enough room here in Young Life because we focus on Jesus, right? We don't have a life of Joseph talk. 
you don't have a life of Elisha talk at Young Life Club, we talk about Jesus every single time. We talk about sin, we don't do the Romans road. We talk about Jesus and how we dealt with sin. We focus on Jesus in all that we do. And not Jesus last, and not Jesus as an afterthought, but as our first response. We pray before we start anything, before we start a meeting. We prayed this morning at 7 a.m. with a group of people to start the day. We pray. That's what we do. We look to Jesus, and we want him in the center of everything that we do. That's part of our DNA. Second, we're relational. And this is one of those things where you can just tell, oh, those are young life people. They're so relational. Or at a school, you can see a group of people that are sitting in the stands they're with kids. They're volunteering. And even teachers can pick it out. Oh, those must be young life leaders. Because who else would go in the band section and stand between the tuba player and the bassoon player? Is that bassoon a thing? Bassoon, bassoon, something like that. <laughs> relational. And even to take a step beyond the word relational is incarnational. We're in. We go in. We enter into the world of people, of kids. And that's risky. And not, that, that's not the approach of the world. Most people would rather have, you, have people come to your event. We go to the kids. Now, if you're a new Young Life leader or new again and kind of forgot how Young Life works, if you're not showing up to kids into their worlds, it's not Young Life. You're just, if you just, well, I just show up on Monday nights. I don't actually talk to kids outside of Monday nights. That's not Young Life. We go to them because we are so committed to relationships because Jesus was so committed. God was so committed he sent his son to enter in and walk with us to show up so we do the same. In fact, I want to take it a step further, that we are so committed to relationships and so committed to being in with each other that if you fill out a volunteer form online to become a Young Life leader, there's something called a faith and conduct form that everybody fills out. And in the conduct form, there's kind of the big three. There's like drugs and alcohol. Like we, we're committed, just not drunkenness, not using drugs. That's just something we're committed to. We want to be just fully available to what God has for us. We don't, we don't need to go to that. The second is our sexual conduct policy, that we want to have pure sexual relationships. We want to, if we're single, we're preparing ourselves for what God has. If we're married, we're honoring that. If you're single or married and there's other influences outside, pornography, all that, all the influences or inappropriate relationships, that's, that, there's no business for that, for us pursuing all that God has for us. But there's the third part of the conduct policy, and that is reconciled relationships. We forget about this one, that that's right up there with our sexual conduct policy and drugs and alcohol. If you're in an unreconciled relationship, that's not relational. That is not the heart of Christ. It's so important. He brings it up over and over and over. Go to your brother and ask for forgiveness. If you're here worshiping and then kind of forget that you have this bitterness against somebody else, go talk to them. We're relational to the core of who we are. Third, healthy. Now, that doesn't mean that we're all like fit running half marathons. It means the way that we do ministry is healthy. It's not just one person doing everything. It's a team of people. Like, if you feel so alone in your Young Life team or Wildlife team, Young Lives, Capernaum, Young Life College, committee, whatever you're doing, if you feel alone, that's not healthy. It's not good for man to be alone or woman to be alone. God made a body of Christ a team that we do things healthy. All right? Diverse. We are diverse. I love you, Crenshaw, president of Young Life. He's talking about, I love how you are pursuing reaching every kid. And it's, not, it's every kid, and it's men and women working together. It's every culture, that we're not just reaching white kids. Or as, as Guile found out when he went to Lower Valley, we're not just reaching uh, Hispanic kids. It's both. Diversity is both, not just one. And to be mindful of that. And I love what's happening in our region. I, I love what's happening in Lewis Clark Valley, how they're, they're starting Young Life with, with the Nez Perce Native American Reservation, the kids at Lapway. And I love what's happening in Yakima in White Swan, reaching the Native American Yakima tribe kids. Like we're going after every kid, and it's hard. And we have to be mindful. And it's also hard just to not have the all college students le leading together. We need adults, that's diversity, age diversity, right? Can we hear a what what for some of us who are a little older, they're kind of feeling a little out there, right? I see it, that's diversity. <laughs> And then we want in every area and every team, we want a visible male and female partnership. Where there's, there's males and females in leadership. In fact, we have somebody here today who, is the, who leads uh, Women's Leadership Network that is really investing in women leaders to say, you have a voice. If you have a gift, you have a place. If you have a passion, you have a place and a voice. Um, and in fact, we're celebrating her 20th year on Young Life staff. Judy Klostermeyer is in the room. <laughs> Thank you. Stand up, Judy. Judy is a champion for diversity, and she has been 
she was a regional director, um, I think about six years ago, for many, many years before that. And she's a champion for diversity, cultural diversity, male, females working together. We, that's part of our DNA and who we are. We need, we need to be committed to that. Our region is 37% Latino. Any Latinos in the house? Or Latinas? 30% of our entire region is Latino. We've got to be aware of this. And we want to have leaders that represent our Latino population. And we've got to raise up leaders and not be exclusive. All right? And then fifth, this is fun. We're not boring. Uh, C.S. Lewis said that uh, joy is a serious business of heaven. Jim Rayburn, the founder of Young Life, said it's a sin to bore a kid with a... You know what else is a sin? It's a sin to bore leaders with a leader meeting. Mm. It's a sin to bore 500 people with a leadership conference. Right? That's why we, we do like the, you know, hey. Uh, it's a sin to bore a committee member with a committee meeting. Any committee members here? All right, there we go. All right, we got some in the house. We're committed to joy and celebration and adventure. It's part of what God's called us to. Last night, I love, just as Kent shared, about 50% of the kids that walk away, even after standing up to say so, thinking, you know, we need to do something about that. We have a world of kids. So 250,000 kids in our region. <coughs> we have a lot of college students, too. Any of my college leaders here? <laughs> We have a lot of college students, 100,000 of them to be exact about. Well, not exact, but it's itch. <laughs> exact ish. But I love, as Jesus stood with the crowds and he saw in Jerusalem, he looked over and Jesus looked. He saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd, they were distressed. Isn't that like kids? You have a slide for that. Oh, oh, yeah, not sure about that one. <laughs> not from this morning. <clears throat> but Jesus looked and he said, he had compassion on the crowds. They're distressed. They're hurting. And he decided to do something about it. Do we have that slide with the verse from Matthew 8? No. Okay, we don't have it. <clears throat> They were like sheep without a shepherd. And so what he did is instead of just seeing that people were hurting and confused, they didn't know what to do, they didn't know where to go, he said, pray to the Lord of harvest you send workers out in the field. Send people out. His plan is you. When he sees hurting kids, when he sees kids walking away, when he sees a culture of kids, he sends us. And so we're setting some goals for this next couple of years. A couple of goals. We want to have... Our sweet spot be relationships with kids. I feel like that's what our best thing that we do. It's not club. Club's not our best thing. Camp is not our best thing. It's contact work. It's being seen and talking with kids and doing something together with them, hanging out. Contact work. It's our bread and butter in young life. Relationships. Showing up to where they are. Building relationships with them. Earning the right to be heard. Why? Just so we can have more friends? We want them to know the good news of Jesus. We want them to know. But we've got to be people who show up. We have to show up. And so our goals have to do with that. Instead of goals about club, we want, to, we want kids to be introduced to Jesus. Our first primary goal is that showing up and just being seen and being known. If a kid is hurting and wants someone to ask a question to, who do they go to? Someone they trust. How do they know who to trust? We've got to show up. Yeah, this is a, this is actually Lewis, Lewis Clark Valley used this, and I stole it from them because I think it fits where I think as a region we want to go. We've listened and heard what a lot of areas are doing. I think this is good. But that main goal, it'd be nice if we had leaders on the team that kids knew who they were. And we say, hey, do you know about Young Life? Like, oh yeah, that's that teacher. That's that leader. That's that parent. That's that coach. That people would know who the Young Life leaders are. But this is the goal, is that 30% of, of every club that we have Young Life at that we know 30% of the kids' names. At every middle school and high school. Young Life College, you're off the hook on this one. I'm going to let you go. Okay? Although Wazoo, we're going to hold you to it. 30% of all the college students. But what if we knew 30% of the kids by name and we prayed for them? And we knew who they were and we'd shown up. What if? Wouldn't that be incredible? Now, some of you at like Garpal, you're like, <laughs> 
seriously? 30% of the kids, we might get all the kids. <laughs> There's like a kid that never shows up to school and we don't know who he is, but everybody else, all 80 of them, we, we got this. So for some of you, this you might bristle at this and think this is ridiculous. So I apologize to some of you schools, you teams that just know every kid. But for some, like Chiawana High School, good lord. Woo! Yeah. There's 2,400 kids at Chiawana High School. Recognize this. You know what? We pray for every kid at Chiawana High School. And so we realize, oh my gosh, we need more leaders, right? Pray the Lord of harvest. He'd send workers out in the field. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And so we look at this as a, a, risk, or a, a serious goal. Look at this. Lewiston High School. 1,000 kids at Lewiston High School. They know 400 of them by name. That's 40% of the kids at school that this team knows by name. We actually keep track of this in Young Life. We've been doing it for years. We don't talk about it, but we're going to start talking about it. Because it's important to know kids' names. Not to perform. Not to feel good. Because that's our sweet spot. That's our bread and butter, friends. Relationships with kids. 150 of them have come to club or camp. 15%. So that's beyond our goal. Lewiston, come on. I wanted to pick a school that I think represents most of us, and that's Coeur d'Alene High School. Where's CDA? Come on. This is probably more typical, whether it's 1,400 or 700 kids, whatever. But knowing about 7% of the kids, having about 3% of the kids go uh, to club, that's, that's like the standard across the region. We've looked at every single school. That's, that's average. That's normal. But we want to raise normal. We want a new normal. To say, you know what, we have this group of leaders, but we're really busy and we're doing the best we can. I say, pray that the Lord will give you more leaders. Pray that the Lord will get a teacher on your team who knows like 400 people. Or a coach. Or a parent who's been coaching kids since they're in kindergarten and soccer and knows all the kids. Pray that God would just expand the team. Chiwana talked about that. Eastmont High School, that's where my wife's from. You know, 18% of the kids, about 4% of them have come to club. Wenatchee High School, 2,200 kids. Wenatchee's the second biggest high school in the state, friends. Did you know that? Come on. 2,200 kids. They know 23% of them. Why? It's a husband and wife teacher team. Where are they? They're around here. All right? I think so. Or they have the same last name. Maybe you don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> They've introduced 7% of them to Jesus. They're on track, and I think just taking that extra step to pray. Canfield Middle School, 800 kids there. They know 200 of them. they got parents who leave. You know, they have a teacher there. 25% of them, they know them. 9% of them introduced to Jesus. Dayton High School, just messes everything up, Dayton. 150 kids. They know 120 of them. they got, like, an elementary school teacher on your team that knows every kid in the town. Oh, wait, Marnie. Yakima, put all Yakima together, every club they have, and they have like 15 clubs, middle school and high school, Young Lives, uh, Capernaum, White Swan. Of all their Young Lives and Wild Lives together, there's 13,000 kids. They know 4,600 of them. Wow. 35% of the kids at every club combined, they know. And 575 of them, about 4.5% have been introduced to Jesus. Why, how is that? They have 31 teachers that lead in their area. Wow. So it's thinking differently. It's thinking differently. I want to invite us into that. Thinking differently. I think Mead High School is very similar to a lot of college towns where you don't have a te- you don't have as many teachers or as many parents on the team. And college students are super busy. And they, they know 5% of the 1,700 kids at Mead High School, according to this last uh, spring, this last fall. And all of them have come to club. That's like a 100% success rate. Every kid they know. Why is that? Because those leaders are so freaking cool. <laughs> They're awesome. But just even expand beyond that and say, you know what? I want to know more kids, even if they don't come to club. I want to know as many. I want to know kids' names. I want, to pray. I want my prayer list to be way bigger than the kids that come to club. Because relationships are so important. This is a crazy goal. This would, a goal would be right now we know about 17,000 kids in our region. <coughs> 17,000. Our prayer for this next two years is that we know 25,000. Maybe even 30,000. We had 1,700 kids go to club or go to camp this last summer, which is 300 up from the year before. This is the biggest camp year we've ever had in the history of in the Northwest. But we're praying in two years that we have 2,000 kids come to camp. 300 more. 
Like, that was a big jump this last year. How many of you guys are tired? Like, couldn't believe you brought all the kids you brought to camp this last year. You didn't know how you did it. <laughs> yeah, we need 300 more, so. Nice. <laughs> yes. Do you want to be astonished? Do you want to be astonished? Do you want to see God do great work? Here's the great thing. You don't have to figure it all out yourself. It's hands open, praying, saying, Lord, use me. Lord, move. Surprise us. What do you want us to do next? And that you be open. We can't do this without prayer. We can't do this without faith. We can't do this without a unified team. You kind of feel like your team's kind of fractured. You're not really hitting on all cylinders. You're not going to be able to do it like that. There's got to be a spirit of unity and leaning in and praying as a first response. And even beyond that, we can't do this without teacher leaders. You got a team full of college students or people who don't really know the kids very well, they're new to the community. Do you know how awesome it is to have a teacher or a coach on the team? Do you know how stinking awesome that is? Like, oh, you, you, you know who you need to meet. Oh, you know where it needs help. The teachers, they got the pulse of the school. There's not teachers and coaches on your team or your area. Pray that the Lord would raise one up. And start doing contact work. Committee members. You're looking around your team. This isn't just about kids. This is about figuring out how can we reach more adults in the community? How can we build more relationships? I want to ask this question. First to say a statement, Young Life's phrase is you were. <coughs> and we just have to ask the question, were we built for this? We built for this. I know we're made for this, but the way, if we're going to have a goal of reaching 9,000 more kids, are we built for that success? And here's a couple steps as we prayed about that we would get there. Here's what we want to do to get to that 30%, 10% goal to reach 9,000 more kids, building relationships and introducing more to Jesus. Is one, teach your leaders. If you've seen it, if you heard it, our goal this last year was to have 100 teacher leaders. Um, a year ago, we had about 70-ish. And I was astonished when I found out we actually got exactly 100. And I think the 100th teacher was a teacher named Drew Willick at Moses Lake High School who said, I want to leave. We had 100 teacher leaders as of the end of October. And our prayer is we want 150 teachers. 150. They're going to lead the charge. They're going to help us to reach these next 10,000 10, kids. It's exciting. The second thing we want to do is invest in new key places. If we want to reach and build 10,000 more relationships, we're investing in these emerging leaders in central Washington. Now, student staff in Spokane, world class. Everyone all around the country talks about what's going on in Spokane. We want something special happening also in central Washington. We're investing in these awesome leaders to reach kids and even to represent the cultures they live in. We're investing in them. Young lives. Young Lives, we're praying Young Lives starts in Tri-Cities and uh, Palouse. We want to see Young Lives thrive in every community that we have. Because team moms are important. And because they deserve to be loved. And we need to build relationships with them. And Moses Lake. So how are we going to reach more kids? How about we pick the fifth biggest high school in the entire state? And just, there's people in the community that are saying, we want our kids to be reached. We're not reaching all of them. And the churches are working together, and we want to come alongside the churches in Moses Lake and reach kids there. And Eastern Washington University, there's this awesome college right there in Cheney. How awesome would it be to go after this? So we want to invest in new key places. A third way we want to get toward this is, again, we need to be healthy, and so we need to come alongside our area directors and have committees own the vision of the area, and key adults own the vision of the area along with the area director. So the area director's not doing everything, because we need them leading the way in discipleship and investing in leaders. Our goal is that 80% of the vision in each area, every area has like five things you're totally committed to. There's like 30 things, but really five. If you ask me, pull them aside, the committee chair, the area director, what are you guys really going after? There's five things. And we want four of those things to be owned by somebody else other than the area director. And right now that's not happening. And so committees and key adults in the community step up and say, you know what, I wanna take on leading the charge in prayer. I want to take on developing or training leaders. Maybe there's a gifted trainer. We had one of those in, in Everett. And uh, now she's leading emerging leaders. There's people who have a gift of training. There's people who have a gift of organization, having people own that. So we need, to, we need help. And then 
Fourth, we want to see awesome events done well to invite the community in. Because we need more people a part of this, and we want to cast the net wide. So we want to have great events. So we're committed as a region to help get behind areas in that. And then the last one is this. And this is kind of where I want to land the plane. <laughs> is discipleship. Discipleship. If 50% of kids walk away after they stand up and say so, what's missing was a guide. What's missing was someone to walk alongside them and show them what it looks like to walk with Jesus. And so we want to get after that. And not only do we want to have every kid possible to walk with Jesus after camp or after they come to know Jesus or leave high school, but it's also Jesus' way that he's changed the world was actually through discipleship. If you look at the model of Jesus, if he was our guide, he invested in how many people? I mean, he reached the masses and crowds, but how many did he focus on? How many disciples? Twelve. And inside that twelve, there was Peter, James, and John. He had three that he went really deep with. Those are like, churches are named after still to talk about Peter, James, and John. But those twelve disciples, he invested in to change the world, to reach the masses, and ultimately the world. And so, this is where I want to invite us into I think that you're here because you want to be astonished. I think you're here because you want to see the world changed. You want to see the school where you've committed that you said, and you could have done other stuff, but you said, I'm going to lead Young Life or Wildlife or Young Lives, Capernaum, Young Life College, committee. You wanted to see God do something great, and you wanted to be a part of it. But you also have this crazy schedule, and you also have crazy insecurities and anxieties, and you're afraid. When you walk into a room full of people, you kind of feel like, ah, do they even like me? I, what's my place? What if someone walks up to me and asks what I'm doing? What am I going to say? Well, unless you got a backpack of hot chocolate, you really don't have a whole lot to say while you're there. Right? I'm here to build relationships. You earn the right to be heard. Right? You've got to have a reason why you show up at school. To come up with a reason, if you don't have one, talk to the teacher or coach. They'll come up with one or your team leader. You show up. And so you want to be a part of this, but you realize... Would you give me three that you would invest? And I realize as, as the invitation comes to say, all I have to do is work with three kids. It's awesome. Such a relief. <laughs> I thought I had to reach like 50 kids. <laughs> but really, the Jesus model is invest in a few to reach the many. And if you guys want to reach underneath your chair? You guys got some trident, trident layers gum? Some of you guys just got trident gum. There's a reason why we chose Trident layers before we ran out of them when we went shopping for them because no one has enough for everybody. But this invitation to do discipleship, to enter in with kids, to go deep with a few, it's not another thing. There's a club, there's contact work, there's campaigner, there's camp, the four C's of Young Life, right? I'm already busy. Now you want me to go deep with three? But actually, the invitation is to add another layer on top of what you're already doing to involve those three, all right? You're leading club. Maybe you're giving a club talk. Well, how would I invest in three? I'm busy doing a club talk. Invite them in. Ask them to say, what do you think people feel like you're speaking on a woman at the well? What kids do you feel like are excluded? What do you think people think that God thinks of them? And you might text them or call them or ask, and they give input into your club talk. You just invited them in. You just showed them what it looks like to think like Christ. Or you're in charge of mixers, or you're in charge of like, I, I, we want to see every kid possible come to this club. Invite them to think like you. Invite them to think with you. Invite them to think better than you. <laughs> right? Invite them in to what you're doing. It's another layer. It's not another thing. Does that make sense? Okay? Contact work. You're going to go to a football game. Who are you going to invite to come with you? Who are you going to say, hey, I'm going to be there. Are you going to be there? Hey, let's, let's meet up. Let's, let's get to know as many kids as we can. Let's show those freshmen that they're important. It's another layer on top of what you're already doing. The campaigners. Inviting the kid. You're already doing campaigners, and maybe it's kind of boring. It's not really clicking real well. Everyone's just farting and giggling. And right. You invite those three to say, hey, what do we need to do to make this better? And ask them their opinion. You say, why don't you open up with the highs and lows, or the crappies and happies, or whatever you do to open up your campaigners. And invite another kid to say, hey, I want you to go first. I'm going to ask this question when we read this chapter in, in Matthew. 
and you invite them in, so you add another layer to campaigners, or camp. Instead of just trying to get all the kids you can get to go to camp or making an announcement at a club, you actually get the three that you're focusing on and say, let's make a prayer list, and let's pray for this every week. And you add names to the prayer list. Does that make sense? You're adding another layer. Discipleship. That's the invitation. And we, as your area directors, your team leaders, we know what it's like. It's crazy busy. Our, our schedules are full. We fear rejection. We're super busy. We don't want to add another thing. But if we can all commit to this, we just pray. And so here's, here's what the plan is. Make a list of every single kid that you know. And maybe you know five right now. Maybe you know 50. Make a list of every kid that you know and start to pray and say, Lord, who is faithful, available, and teachable? Who is faithful, available, and teachable? What does that mean? Who shows up? And it might not just be Jesus stuff. It might be their sports. It might be school. They're super faithful. They may not have translated that to God yet, but you can see they're faithful. They do what they say they're going to do. Available. They make themselves available for what's important and teachable. When you ask them to do something or you ask them to pray or read something, they actually do it. They learn. They want to learn. If you have faithful, available, teachable you're investing in, friends, that's what Jesus did. They were ordinary people that changed the world. Make a list of everyone you know and, and actually look through and say, who? Lord, show me who's faithful, available, and teachable. And see if that translates. Invite them in to come to know Jesus. Show them what you're doing. Invite them into what you're doing. And choose three. Look for how God is working in their life, not go. <laughs> so you're inviting them into what you're doing, but you're also asking what's God doing in your life. And they most likely don't know. And that's where scripture is powerful. That's where prayer is powerful. Inviting them to have a 15-minute quiet time in their town in the morning and asking them how it went. Invite them into deeper waters. That's discipleship. And don't just stop with the three. You're always inviting them to think of their peers, their school. Remy shared about middle school kids and how she started. That was intentional. So, you know what? Share what you have. Share with other people. So here's what we're going to do to finish. We're going to give you guys something. This is a bookmark. Oh, this is a box. <laughs> The bookmark is one side and has an invitation to say what we're doing. Guys, we can't do this without Jesus, anything we're talking about. And it says if you're doing it right, you need Jesus more. <laughs> and that's really what we want. We want to be astonished. And on the back side, it has 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, an awesome verse worthy of memorizing and room for three names. But first, write down every kid's name that you know. And if you only know a couple kids' names, you know, maybe you need to spend more time getting to know more kids' names. If you only know three kids, that doesn't, need, that doesn't mean that's your three. Get to know 25 or 50 or 100 and pray as you meet them. Who could I invest in, Lord? Who would you have that I could go deep with? That could change the school together and change their life forever and write down those three. So that's the call to action. Guys, I want to pray.